This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and Scott German talking today on the eve of UVA Duke, number two versus number four. And, uh, you know, Scott and I were talking uh, about it for me anyway. I wish it was already Saturday at 2 o'clock. But, you know, we got some time. We got some time to, uh, to, to enjoy, I guess, the last few hours of the walk-up to this game and, uh, you know, anticipate a lot. Uh, uh, Scott, uh, you know, how, how, how are you keeping sane right now? It's hard for me to, so how are you keeping sane right now? Uh, lots of uh, walks and fresh air and um, adult beverages. Well, I can't say adult beverages, I guess, because I don't, I don't consume adult beverages. But uh, I'm just trying to read about things, other other issues and other other events in the world that might be some people might consider more important, like uh, Trump and uh, things going on in the basketball world that uh, that uh, outside of UVA. But it's difficult. It's very difficult. But um, you know, it's it's going about pretty good, and I'm and I'm ready for it to, to I'm ready for it to tip off more. So I've talked, Scott, uh, and Jeff Fife was with me yesterday. We we talked. I, I broke down the game and some of the keys. I uh, want to get your sense of of your thoughts on that. I mean, you've been watching this this program for you know your entire life. You've been covering them for forty plus years. You, what what do you see as as some of the keys to the game for Virginia? It, and we have to admit it will be an upset, even though Virginia's number two, Duke's number four. You're on the road at the number four team. So, what would it take for Virginia to pull the upset and beat Duke tomorrow? Well, I, for Virginia to play Virginia basketball, and um, you know, if you're going to ask me, am I confident that Virginia is going to go down the camera and win tomorrow? I, I want to say that I am more confident that Virginia can go in there and get a win now than I was even as little as two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason for that is one player, and that's DeAndre Hunter. Uh, Because now I'm convinced. I was never not convinced that we couldn't defensively uh, crash out on on this, but I was a little concerned that we would have enough offensively to to battle Duke. Um, but with the emergence of Hunter and how well he's played offensively for the last couple of weeks, and, and also, you know, we don't want to go too far without mentioning how well he's played defensively, because we all know it doesn't matter how good of an offensive player he is. He'd be on the bench with one of the best seats in the house if he, if he wasn't holding up his end of the bargain on the defensive floor, uh, on the defensive end of the floor. So, because Andre, the Andre has stepped up his game offensively and has given us a, a, just a, out another complete dimension to our game. I'm a lot more confident than I than I was two weeks ago, but I'm still probably slightly less than fifty percent. But two weeks ago, I probably would have been somewhere around the twenty percent uh, <laughs> probability, if that means anything. I'll I'll throw out too. So DeAndre Hunter, we've been talking we've been talking a lot, and I've been writing a lot about DeAndre Hunter the last few weeks because his his emergence, uh, five of the last six games uh, in, in ACC play, double figures for him scoring. Even the other night against Clemson, didn't have double digits in that game, uh, but he he played stellar defense, a season high twenty seven minutes with with uh, Isaiah Wilkins on the bench for the last seventeen minutes of that sh- shutdown of of Clemson uh, in that sixty one thirty six win. I'll throw Jack Salt out there. We talk about Salt a lot, too. You know, not a lot of Virginia fans and, and certainly the media uh, thinks much about Jack Salt. He's sort of just a appendage on this this uh, this fist of, of the Virginia defense in a lot of ways. He doesn't put stats up, and not just offensive stats. He doesn't even have a lot of rebounding stats or block shot stats. But he plays 20 to 25 minutes a game for a reason, his, his positional defense in the post. And against this Duke team, the size this Duke team has, that's the only thing that worries me uh, is that uh, – you know, you got Marvin Bagley the third and Wendell Carter. Uh, they're both 6'10", 6'11". I think Bagley's 6'11". He's 230, so he's a little, little, little thinner there at, you know, at his height. But uh, Carter is 6'10", about 255. Uh, big boy. And, um, and so Salt's going to have to have you – know, we, might, we might have to have Salt go 30 minutes tomorrow uh, to you know, be able to guard one of those two guys. I'm not sure which guy that, 
that Tony puts him on. Uh, you know, and certainly Isaiah Wilkins, he's the best defensive player in the country, post or perimeter, but Isaiah's given up some size here. He's 6'7", listed at 6'7". I'm not sure if he's actually 6'7". Now, he's stouter than he was in past years. Uh, he's, putting up, he's, he's about 235, 240, uh, up from when he was a freshman. He was 220. But, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's going to give up some inches, you know, to, the, to those guys in the post. Hunter probably does, too. Hunter gives up inches and size. He's about 215. Uh, so we're going to need Jack Salt to really, you know, stay out of foul trouble early, uh, but also just just bang uh, with, with whoever he's with. And he's probably going to have time on both of those big guys. Salt's going to be a real key. Even if he doesn't score a point, grab more than a couple of rebounds, how Jack Salt plays, I think, goes a long way to determining how Virginia plays tomorrow. I agree. Um, you know, he's going to have to give us a Jack Salt-like performance uh, and up it maybe just a tad bit. And that doesn't mean anything's going to show up in the offensive category as far as points. But, um, yeah, and he's probably going to be asked to play a few more minutes. I wouldn't be surprised if his minute total does um, get into the upper 20s, maybe even hit the 30-minute mark, provided, provided that all-important – uh, X factor is that he doesn't step off the bus down in Durham tomorrow with two fouls, <laughs> uh, uh, and we know that that that's certainly within the realm of possibility. You know, another another thing that I that I that I'm feel confident about that, that that makes me feel a little more confident uh, is I was reading an interesting article, and I, and I think it was a very uh, Duke biased article about how improved the Duke defense was over the course of the last four or five games. Well, Chris, do you know over the last five games, Duke has played the two worst teams in the Atlantic Coast Conference three times. They played Pitt twice and Wake one. Actually, Wake actually Wake twice. Actually, Wake twice. The four of their last five have been two against Wake and two against Pitt. So you're right on there. They should be playing better defense, right? They should be playing better ever. Statistically, they should be playing better everything when they're playing the, the you know, right now the bottom dwellers of the of the ACC. Four or five games. That's that's as that's as big a candy run as I could possibly imagine a team having this year in the ACC. So, so from that standpoint, uh, what are they going to? How are they going to respond? At least. On their uh, on the defensive end of the floor, or, or excuse me, when they're playing, how are they going to respond to this Virginia defense? I mean, that's not. I, I know when the schedule laid out, you know, I'm sure Shashevsky, no one had a, a crystal ball to see that these two teams would Wake and Pitt would be playing so poorly. But um, it is what it is, and that certainly hasn't uh, really given Duke a whole lot of. Uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, preparation for p- playing a Virginia team. I don't know if it's it possible that you could ever uh, prepare f- for playing a UVA defensive team unless you just play eight on five in your practice. So, yeah, I'm just that's another thing that I, I think is going to favor UVA is that Duke's not going to be quite ready to face that defensive intensity that you know they're going to get from from the very get go tomorrow. Well, and for all the talk about Virginia having a supposed glut of home games at the start of the ACC schedule, I mean, Virginia's played five of eight at home. Uh, this will be the ninth game, and it'll be the fourth on the road. The three of the last four for Duke have been at home, and, and those three three were Wake, Pitt, and Wake. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's uh, two of four, but Wake, uh, uh, home, at, uh, home with Wake at Miami, home with Pitt, and then in a way at Wake, which isn't much of a road game, just a few miles down the road in a, in a not very difficult environment to play in, you know, they did beat Miami uh, and and, um, and beat them on the road. That was that was an impressive win. Uh, they were down 13, seven minutes to go, and, and took over with their defense. Uh, their defense, though, was well, they went zone. Uh, and Miami also struggled against Louisville. Louisville doesn't play a zone technically, but their man looks like a zone. I watched a lot of that game the other night. Uh, Miami is just offensively challenged. Uh, if you look at Miami, that's the one game of the last five that has anything impressive to it. And uh, Miami on offense this year ranked just 86 in, all, in, in adjusted efficiency by KenPalm.com. So you're not talking about something there uh, that even even that one signature win of the last two or three weeks for Duke uh, 
you know, it's on the road. Yeah, give them credit for that. But against a team that has trouble scoring itself, so so yeah, you know, this this great run of defense by Duke is is bolstered largely by their their you know lesser opposition. So to turn the tables and ask you a question, um, what happens? Um, who do you think is facing the, mo- the more pressure in this game, Virginia or Duke? And what happens if Virginia does beat Duke from these for these two teams? Does it mean anything at all? I mean, really. I mean, one game uh, in an Atlantic Coast Conference schedule of eighteen. Uh, well, how does if you're the coach of Duke or Virginia to win or lose? How do you spend the rest of the season? Well, I, I know that that we as Virginia fans and followers know what the Dukes and Carolinas have known for a long time, which is you want to win every game you go out there and play you know, in a regular season, but you know the games that really count are the ones in March. So that said, uh, this is an important barometer for both teams. It's a more important barometer for Duke, I would say. It, it, you know, Virginia's 8-0. Even if they lose the game, they're 8-1. Even if they lose by 30 points at Duke, you write that off and say, well, you know, it was at Duke. They needed it more, etc." Uh, if you're Duke, you know, you've, you've lost twice to lesser opposition. I mean, no offense to Boston College and NC State, but, you know, NC State may be on the bubble of the NCAA tournament. I don't know that they are right now. And Boston College isn't even near the bubble of the NCAA tournament. And, and Duke lost to both those teams. Now, on the road, yes, uh, but uh, they didn't play good defense either of those games. They didn't play, obviously, as good offense as they could have because they lost those games uh, uh, to those teams. And, uh, you know, Duke can ill afford a loss at home. Not for, you know, it's not about the ACC regular season. We love, we Virginia fans especially, you know, we haven't, our, our run of success has been recent. Uh, so anytime they get a chance to put a banner up, we want to put a banner up. But it's not about the ACC regular season as much, though, as the confidence of the team. And if Duke loses this game to a Virginia team that, boy, I mean, if you're Duke, you've got a, a, basically a six man rotation, five of them are freshmen. All six of those guys are likely to be in the NBA draft next year because Grayson Allen's a senior. He's got to go. I mean, he, whether he's in the draft or not, he's done. Uh, but I think he's a first-round pick. And then I think three or four of those other guys are probably first-round picks, and the other two are probably second-round picks. I, I just don't think you're going to see any of those top six back next year, especially when you look at the you know the, the recruiting class they have coming in next year. So if you're this Duke team, this is your chance, and really your only chance, between now and the NCAA tournament to, to establish yourself as a top team because at this stage North Carolina is diminished. They lost to Virginia Tech the other night. They're not they're not anybody that that should you know they they play Duke uh, at home and home obviously uh, you know and I think the first game's uh, in, in about ten days or so. Uh, but um, uh, you know Carolina's not a you know Carolina's not a signature win even if they beat them twice. It's not a signature win. Uh, you know honestly Duke this is this is the toughest game left on Duke's schedule until the NCAA tournament. And uh, if, if they go out and lose this game at home to a Virginia team with, with supposedly far less talent than, than what Duke has on the floor, then, yeah, I think it, what it does is f- for Coach K and for those players, it probably p- plants some big seeds of doubt into, in, into whatever ability they have to win a national championship. And, and so, yeah, they need to go out there and win that just to, just to be able to maintain confidence heading into March. Uh, I, I, I think that's true. Um, you know, I kind of look at it <clears throat> that that there is some pressure. I mean, I'm not saying that Tony's going to, you know, it hasn't already gotten into the kid's head about he, he, in his mind he's he's already put, knows how he's going to, you know, move forward regardless. But I, I don't think a uh, a loss um, certainly doesn't you know, damage the season or, or seeding significantly. I think, however, if you did lose to do, it doesn't, for the time being, um, would move us down in the seed line. And that could, you know, that could inevitably, inevitably at the end of the season when the NCAA tournament uh, selection committee, uh, you know, makes their announcements, it could be the difference between being a number one or a number two seed. Um and that could be the difference between opening up here, in the, you know, in our region, or maybe getting shipped out to the west somewhat. So if you lose to do it, just you know, going by what you just said, this is going to probably be Duke's toughest game the rest of the season. 
and they hold serve after tomorrow, then it might be hard for UVA to, to, to recapture that number one seat and stay local. I don't know if that really means anything at the end of the, at the, end of the day when you, when you open the, the tourney play and you run into a hot team, but I mean, it, it, it could if you look at it just, you know, taking it further down the road. I'll, I'll throw that. That's a good point you make, and I'll throw out that ESPN, the BPI, the Basketball Power Index, uh, that you know they use their uh, their predictive analysis kind of machine to uh, to give you some thoughts on on these kind of games. If they they ran numbers on if Virginia wins, Virginia loses, Duke wins, Duke loses, what your chance is to be a number one national seed. If Virginia wins, they're 95% chance to be a number one national seed. I think that's probably low. They win this game. They're not losing the rest of the way, which is just – I can't believe I'm even saying that, that out loud. But you look at the rest of the schedule, and, and they're favored – after this game, they're favored in every game the rest of the season. So, uh, if, if – and So, if Virginia wins this game, 95% chance of being a number one seed. If Virginia loses the game – 87% chance of being a one seed because they still have that same schedule. Uh, you know, that, that looks like they, they'll be favored every game the rest of the regular season. If Duke wins the game, they're a 65% chance to be a number one seed. Now, even if they win, 65% chance. If they lose, a 38% chance. Their schedule gets a lot tougher as, as the second half of the season goes on. They got Carolina twice, for example. They got Notre Dame. Uh, they got Syracuse. So their schedule gets a lot tougher. Virginia's is re- rather manageable. Uh, so. Uh, that said, yeah, I mean, this game four years ago, uh, actually three years ago, I guess, it was tw- the 2014-2015 season, Virginia entered this game with Duke, and that game was in Charlottesville that year, 19-0 record. That Duke team came in reeling a bit. Uh, they were 4-3 and three in the ACC that, that, at, at that point that year. Um, and uh, Duke came back in the last five minutes, won that game, and, and didn't lose the rest of the way. Actually, they lost uh, one game in the ACC tournament, so they lost one game after after the Virginia game, the rest of the way, won six in March and April and, and won the NCAA tournament. And and we know that Virginia, of course, as, as Scott laid out here, I mean, they, they dropped to the two-seed line even with a 29-3 and three regular season record and, uh, and and then lost in the second round to Michigan State. So in that sense, yeah, th- these kind of things can can matter in that sense. But, you know, you look at th- that team was different. That's, you know, that, that scenario with Duke was different. Uh, it, I think that that's why I still throw out there that this game is is much much more important for Duke because, you know, they win this game and it could be the the the, the ignition point kind of like for that 2015 team that you know had Jamil Okafor and Justice Winslow and uh, a young Grayson Allen at that point they they if they lose that game you know they may bounce out of the first round of the tournament um, because they would have had no confidence after that uh, they won the game they built some confidence. Uh, we uh, some of us remember Scott. You remember, I'm sure that uh, the, the the reaction of the Duke group when they when they won that game in the tunnel right there uh, in front of the media room. Uh, they acted like they won the national championship that day. Turned out that kind of was one of the reasons they won the national championship that year. They could beat that Virginia team. So if they can win this game tomorrow, and I'll say this, I was in, and we got to talk about this a little bit uh, as we get to the second half of the podcast. Last time I was at a Duke UVA game uh, in in Durham, uh, the, the only time I've been at a Duke UVA game in Durham was 2014, the year before that, and and I remember that was an early season game, uh, the year that Virginia won the uh, ACC regular season, beat Duke for the ACC tournament. Duke came back in the second half, beat a Virginia team, won that three pointer. From I think it was Rashid Suleiman that bounced up in the air about five feet before it went through the net with about ten seconds to go. When I remember when Coach K left the floor, I'd never seen him that jubilant before. Like he he knew he had beat a good team, but we didn't know he had beaten a good team. That was still maybe third or fourth ACC game that year. Uh, you know Virginia would after that game go on a twelve game winning streak, but he knew that he had done something that day to, to, for his team to beat that Virginia team. And so I, I have a feeling, I mean, I, I know he's, he's talking about those two wins over Virginia uh, and he's trying to pump his guys up because I think he knows how important this game is, not just for seeding or anything else, I think for confidence. And, and so I'll just throw out there one more thought. Uh, Virginia goes out and, and plays like they did against Florida last year in the NCAA tournament. That, that to me, is the only scenario where a, a Virginia loss uh, is, is, is damaging. You know, you lose by five points, you lose by one point, you know, whatever. Uh, if you're competitive and lose tomorrow, nobody's going to, you know, be upset about that. But if you go out and lay an egg tomorrow, that's where you say, eh, you know, we beat some teams, but we got blown out. Uh, we'll have to kind of start from scratch here. That's the only thing that I'm concerned about, is, is and, and that would be the only thing that would concern me, would be a blowout loss there. Anything else, 
I think I can handle. Right. <clears throat> um, you don't want to lay an egg. And I, I, well, I don't think anyone anticipates that because the difference between that team that played Florida in, in the second round of the NCAA tournament last year and this team is light years. This team is much more athletically uh, athletic on offense and more weapons. It's just not a completely different UVA team. Um, now, you know, you regardless of what we think of Mike of Shashesky, and we can't really probably say a lot of what we think of him over the air, but the thing he is good at is that, you know, inspiring his teams. And I remember reading an article, and it made me feel kind of good at, uh, at the time, uh, that he, in that 14-15 season, he, he actually attributed to getting over the hump and being a national championship quality team uh, in that game against Virginia uh, that you were talking about when, when they when they beat us in JPJ, is that correct? That's right, yep, yep. 19-0? Yep. And, uh, yeah. They haven't been playing with that good a defense all year, and they, they, they played a much better defensive game that night, certainly a passable defensive game. I mean, and they went on to be a much better defensive team for the rest of the year. And he, he in, in one of the articles I read, to look back on the season and, and, and basically pointed to that night, like that, when he might have saw it, so saying, what put Duke over the hump as far as being a team that had legitimate national championship uh, uh, hopes. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he's not letting, letting that fact, he's not letting that, you lose his current team, you know, because no one's saying this is a good defensive this team. They're, I think their Kim Palm ratings is way low. I think they've improved a little bit lately, but yeah, it's hard not to imagine them improving when you play Wake and Pitt four out of five games. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> knowing Krzyzewski, that's a fact that he's impressive upon this team. Hey, people say we don't play great D. There's a chance to really show who we are and, and what it's going to take to win a national championship. So, um, I don't think anyone will be surprised or should be surprised if we don't see Duke's A game defensively tomorrow. Yeah. Is, what is Duke's A game? What, is, what are they capable of if you play? And, and the limitation there is their rotation. They really only go about six deep. And uh, that's why he goes to a zone a lot in second half of games. And the zone worked against Miami. And Miami, you know, watching that Miami game, uh, they were up 13 about seven minutes to go. Uh, and, and then Duke went zone. And it wasn't that they were playing a Syracuse 2 3, you know, like the way Syracuse plays 2 3, or way, you know, the way teams who zone regularly, you know, have principles. They just kind of, you know, they, they, the guys were aligned in a 2 3 zone. Miami, the response by Miami was what was surprising. Jim Laranig is a good coach. Uh, he he's, you know took George Mason to the Final Four. He won an ACC tournament with Miami. He's got that program uh, back into prominence. And uh, but the you you know that this Duke team goes to his own defense in the second half, not really because that's that that's their signature defense. It's because they get desperate. And they're also tired because they really only play, for the most part, five guys. I mean, they, they'll, they'll bring a guy off the bench, but he only plays 10 minutes a game. So they're tired, and, they, you know, they, they play zone because zone lets you stand in position and not have to move around that much. And so the fact that Larry Nega wasn't prepared for that and called a couple timeouts and still couldn't get his players to execute a basic zone play had, is, to me, had as much to do or more to do with Duke coming back and winning that game as Duke playing great zone defense. Um, and so... You know, and, and I wrote a column, Scott, a couple weeks ago about Duke uh, and their defense uh, and, and over the last seasons. You know, the, the, the first year for them of the one-and-done era, you know, Coach Calipari at Kentucky has been using the one-and-dones for several years. Coach K really only started using them in 2014 when Jabari Parker arrived for his one year. Um, when you go back to uh, the 2014 season and all the way through to now, um, these numbers should stand out. 2014, adjusted defense, 86th. 2015, 11th, 2016, 86th, 2017, 47th, and 2018, 70th. The team that was 11th was the one that won the national championship. Uh, so that, you know, and, and the others lost in the first round or second round of the NCAA tournament. So 
this team is more like those teams that lost early in tournaments, not like the team that won a championship. Yeah, he's, he's trying to tell his guys, hey, you go out there and play defense tomorrow, and you can show yourself to be something. But actually, if you look at that team in 2015, he's a good salesperson, Scott. We know, we know that. That 2015 team played defense pretty much all season long. Um, that, that, you know, they beat Virginia, and that was impressive, but they didn't beat them just because of defense. In fact, Virginia scored uh, in that game uh, 63 points on 58 possessions. So uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, not a, that's not a championship defensive resume game for Duke either. Um, they won the game because they scored 22 points in the last four minutes of that game, uh, not because of great defense. So uh, he's, But that's what he's telling his guys, no doubt. And, um, you know, I don't know that this Duke team, this, that this Duke team is capable of, of playing more than a few minutes of, of zone defense against that, that are effective against teams who don't know how to play zone offense. Fortunately for our fan base, Virginia knows how to play zone offense, and uh, so you almost want to dare Duke into playing zone because you know Virginia plays Syracuse well uh, offensively every time they go out there and play. Uh, I can't think who was it recently. Uh, somebody uh, there was another recent team that that tried to go uh, Wake Forest tried to go zone against Virginia a couple times. Uh, you slide that guy down at the foul line, you pass it into him. It's either it's usually either uh, Hunter or Wilkins. They either hit the little twelve foot jump shot, they pass to the perimeter for the open three, they they crash down to the to the post guy for a dunk. I mean, Virginia knows how to play against his own, and and uh, so if, if that's Coach K's secret weapon, bring it on. Well, what um, what discussion of playing Duke with what? How could we possibly not? throw in for Virginia fans uh, the conspiracy theory. We have to, yes. And and, and say, uh, what is, okay, how long does it take Jack Salt to get two fouls? Actually, more importantly, or, how long does it take Isaiah Wilkins to get yeah, two fouls? Or, or Isaiah Wilkins, right. Or uh, or what is the, what, is the uh, what will be the, the free throw disparity? And, and, and you can't really look at that because we know how uh, makeup calls work. They'll, they'll they'll make that balance out somewhat on paper, but crunch time. What's the free throw disparity? So, um, you know, we wouldn't be true UVA fans if we didn't throw that out a little bit. So, I'm, with that said, I'm just kind of trying to find out if there's any way of knowing in advance who the officiating who the officiating crew will be tomorrow. But I don't guess the the network or the uh, conference puts that out in advance. I don't, I, and I don't even know that it matters what their names are because they'll get their pregame reports telling them what to do. Um, I, I've thought this too, Scott, and I hate to be this way, but we we've watched. And if you're listening to this podcast, almost 30 minutes in, you've watched a lot of ACC basketball over the years as well. And um, yeah, you know, I think we'll all be watching for that first four minutes before the media timeout. First media timeout. Uh, does Virginia have a guy on the bench with two fouls? And is, is it either Salt or Wilkins, or, or both? I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, do we see a, a chintzy offensive foul called on Ty Jerome? Uh, do we see the Duke guys uh, getting away with grabbing and clutching Kyle Guy on, on screens and not getting called for that? You know, it, we can really tell in the first five minutes if this is going to be on the up and up, or if it's going to be more like a WWE scripted wrestling match, uh, that uh, the, the, the outcome is predetermined and we just have to go through the motions to get there. Uh, and I'll be honest, Scott, uh, you know, I have, I've been, and I told this to Jeff Fife yesterday, I've been making the case for a few days all the way, all the reasons Virginia should win this game. And I think, I mean, to me, if this game's played straight up, Virginia wins this game. It, it, I, I don't think it's a question of, you know, if, 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 if the game's played straight up, who's a better team, Duke or Virginia? Virginia's a better team. I don't care that it's at, at Duke and, and Cameron. I think Virginia wins this game straight up. But we also both know that the ACC does not want Duke to be three games behind Virginia, even though we want to call the regular season somewhat meaningless, et cetera. Uh, no, they, they want Duke to get a number one seed. They want Duke to win the national championship. Uh, if Virginia gets there on their own, congratulations, go, go, you know, go who's. But uh, this conference wasn't built – uh, on Virginia, this conference was built in Duke and UNC, and so UNC's having an off year this year. It's Duke's turn, and and we will see in the first five minutes tomorrow uh, whether or not uh, the ACC is going to play this fair or they're going to play it the way we know they're going to play it, uh, which is uh, let's foul Virginia out and make sure there's not even a chance they win this game. Well, I, and I, I agree, and and you know you you made mention. 
that we followed a lot of UVA basketball, and I followed ACC basketball, UVA basketball for thirty some years. And and I'm going to tell you, um, if someone were to ask me, is there a bias in the conference? You better believe there's a bias in the conference, and because they're going to protect their marquee teams, and their marquee teams in basketball are Duke and North Carolina. It's shifting, and it's going it's going to change, and it'll change even more when. When Boy Williams and, and Shashevsky leave, it, it, some people say it's already changed, but it hasn't completely changed yet. And um, it's in the best interest for the ACC to have Duke in that position uh, to, to get a number one seed, to be at home, to be somewhere in the East South or wherever. Um, and I've seen those biases. I've seen them up close. I've seen them uh, from court level. Uh, uh, Krzyzewski has an intimidation factor over the officials. He has it even over the established officials, but he has it even, he has it uh, significantly more over some of the young officials who know that at the end of the year they get graded and if they get graded out poorly by the right coaches, uh, they're back doing ODAC games or, or CAA games. So, uh, to say that there's not a bias in the ACC as far as officiating goes, uh, you'd have to be awful, awful gullible to believe that because it, it, it does happen and it does exist. That's not to say it will happen tomorrow because Virginia just could come right out and take control of that game and, and let, not let the officials have a say in it. But knowing how different the two teams are made up, um, the best way Duke can um, offset UVA's depth uh, is to get a couple of their players in quick foul trouble, early foul trouble. That's that's how you offset the depth uh, issue disparity. Oh yeah, that's uh, and and I'm trying to look real quick. I got some stats up here, um, and, and here's the telling stat. And, and I knew this was going to be the case. I just had to look it up and make sure. Okay, so. Uh, if Virginia ends up with a, a huge disparity in fouls uh, over Duke, right now uh, in the national rankings, Virginia ranks 348th in personal fouls. 300, there's 351 teams. Virginia has committed less fouls than all but three teams. Uh, right now in the ACC, they're actually 14th, so somehow one of those teams is, is an ACC team. Uh, but... Uh, uh, so if it, you know, and, and Virginia averages doing that quick math there, they average right about 13 fouls a game. So uh, if <laughs> if we see foul trouble, if, if Virginia has a bunch of guys sitting on the bench in the first half in foul trouble, we know what's happening, uh, and we've seen it before, and we'll see it again. Uh, just looking to see real quick, and it's not Duke, by the way. Duke, in fact, is third in fouls in the ACC. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 you know, that, that one of their big guys, Wendell Carter, has fouled out twice. He's had four fouls seven times in a game this year. So, you know, you can just imagine he's going to probably commit one foul uh, probably in the second half uh, when the game's already over, uh, and, and that's going to be his, his contribution for the day. It's, you know, I hate to be this way, but it's, you know, I, I don't want to complain after the fact. So we're complaining before the fact. Well, we're preparing people. We're prepared. Yeah, we're yeah. Checked off the 
the depth situation when Isaiah sitting on the bench or, or Ty Jerome or anyone, Ty died. Uh, so, you know, it's not how many fouls it's called because they, at the end of the half, they can make that look pretty good. And they usually do. It's generally not glaring is different. Uh, but, you know, again, I know it sounds like I'm a conspiracy theory believer, but Sorry, I've seen it. I've seen it play out. Yeah. Some years. Yeah. Yeah. Time, yeah. yeah, they got to be careful because uh, no question that, uh, uh, you know, they, they've got to make sure, the ACC's got to make sure, you know, it's, it's, it's just protecting your, your investments, all that is. So, um, exactly. And the ACC's a business. And yeah, ACC's a business, and the marketing's still set up the way it's set up. So, yeah. Um, so uh, now we've really prepared you. We talked some X's and O's. We talked some uh, coaches' strategy, how they'll talk to their teams, and then we we we, we brought you into the re- realm of conspiracy. Which, hey, it's 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 only conspiracy if uh, if you don't believe it. Uh, the X, you know, I watched the X Files. I watched I watched you know, I was a big fan of the X Files. Uh, if if uh, you know, the, the truth is out there, and if you believe the lie, it's it's true. So I don't know. There's all that kind of stuff out there. I. Uh, the game is at 2 o'clock tomorrow. CBS, I think it's our only appearance on CBS this season, uh, will be live blogging during the game. Uh, Scott and I will try to pull ourselves together to do a, a podcast afterwards uh, and, and break it down for you. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of postgame coverage especially. I've done, I've done several pregame uh, previews. So uh, we got you all ready. Uh, this podcast is our last pregame podcast. So now uh, we will just uh, try to somehow get through. For us, it's about 4 o'clock on Friday as we're finishing up. Uh, we'll try to get through the next 22 hours somehow, some way. And, Scott, uh, I wish you the best of luck because I'm already frothing at the mouth. I don't know how you're going to get through the next 22 hours because I'm, ar- I'm already spinning. I'm already uh, – that, that's where I am right now. So uh, best of luck to you. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you this. Uh, I've sent the wife packing for the weekend and, and, and looked looking out for her best interest <laughs> and I only will ask this to, to UVA fans that are listening um, if we do lose please be kind to your pet <laughs> uh, don't be kicking the dog out the door uh, and uh, you know the sun will come up Sunday morning I promise yeah, yeah, it'll come up either way that's right So, for Scott German I'm Chris Graham signing off Wahoo Wah talk to you again soon